假青年，嘴你嘴烂，很多年，你说你对不对？ The Joker once said, "Better to be slapped with the truth than kissed with a lie. Never hide your bad side to make someone stay. Always show your bad side and see who can stay. Some day, someone will break you so badly that you will become unbreakable. Why should I apologize for the monster I've become? No one ever apologized for making me this way." Remember, I'm not heartless. I'm just learned to use my heart less. Hello, and welcome to Crime Bites, the show where we talk about some truly bizarre and disturbing crime cases. My name is Liz, and today is True Crime Tuesday. So last week we talked about Wade Wilson, who most definitely was a cold-blooded psychopath with face tattoos, earning him, among other nicknames, the Joker Killer. Today we're going to meet another killer who earned that nickname in preparation for the latest Joker movie, Folly Adu. And just like Wade Wilson, Jamie Asuna has the facial tattoos to go with the nickname. And although they both share a lack of remorse and both have said, "I'd do it again," I personally feel this story has a bit more to it. So get ready for some sick twists. And this will be my warning to you now. These crimes are gruesome. But before we do that, we're going to pause for a quick promotion. We all know the Joker is famous for asking people, "Do you want to know how I got these scars?" Well, do you want to know how I got the smile? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. But anyways, it's snow. My teeth were a bit on the yellow side before using snow, and now they are nice and bright. And the treatment is fast, easy, and affordable. You don't need more than a half hour a day, and after the initial treatment, you can really just do touch-ups. And I've been using Snow for over three years now. The company's grown quite a bit, and they have a lot of great products with the focus of getting your smile nice and bright. If this sounds good to you, you can click the link in my description for 25% off your first order of Snow, and keep smiling bright. All right, let's get back to today's story. So today we are going to start at the Curacan State Prison in Curacan, California. It's a male-only maximum security prison that is designed to take in California's most violent offenders. It is specifically located in California's Central Valley, so if anyone did escape, they would be met with some very harsh desert terrain. Since it opened in 1988, it has housed names like Rodney Alcala. Juan Corona, Charles Manson, Joe Pegleg Morgan, and Joseph Sun. It has also been involved in quite a few controversies involving inmates with guards, along with many allegations, including gladiator fights being staged between the inmates. There were also quite a few prison brutality settlements that have been paid out over the years. So it's a very rough environment, and that's putting it kindly, it seems. Officer misconduct seems to be a recurring issue over the years, and it almost definitely is a factor in today's case. So we are at arguably the roughest prison in California in March of 2019, and Luis Romero was being transferred from Mule Creek State Prison. He had already served 27 years for a second-degree murder, and the date when he would be eligible for parole was fast approaching. They would put him in a cell with Jamie Osuna, who had a life sentence for murder that he committed in 2011. Jamie was a self-professed Satanist with more face tattoos than last week's Joker Wade Wilson. There they are again. Anyhow, Jamie had a history of attacking his cellmates, and yet they still decided to put Luis in his cell. So the next morning, the guards who would check in on Jamie and Luis would stumble upon an extremely horrific and grisly scene. Luis was dead, but not just dead; he was completely mutilated and dismembered. Jamie Asuna had decapitated him, and from the looks of the autopsy, he had tortured him first. He had removed one of his eyes, chopped off his finger, then went on to his chest and removed portions of his ribs and made himself a necklace from the ribs and other parts of his body. He also had removed a part of the lung, which apparently he flung at the officers who found him. 
he had posed the body in a very grotesque fashion and had sliced a joker grin onto Luisa's face. He wrote, ha 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 ha, and the man with a thousand faces on the wall in Luisa's blood. He did all of this with a razor blade that had a string wrapped around it. So without getting too crazy here, that's a lot of work, a lot of activity. My point is it would have taken Jamie a lot of time to do the terrible things I just described. And the guards at Karakan were supposed to be checking the cells as much as every half hour, if not every couple hours. I couldn't find the exact time frame, but it would have been way more frequent than would have allowed for this, all of this to occur. So why didn't this get stopped or caught? Or why was it allowed to be carried out to the extent that it was? Something wasn't right, and Luisa's family felt the same way, so they brought a lawsuit against the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. They know that this won't get Luis back, but they do hope to have certain questions answered, and as of right now, it seems that they still haven't been. The last thing that I found was that it was still scheduled to move forward. It was approved and moving forward, but... One thing that they state in the lawsuit is that the cell was covered so that you couldn't really see in and it was covered by a bed sheet. I'm sorry, but wouldn't that be your first indication to investigate further instead of just marking your little check mark and carrying on or whatever may have happened? Did they really not see anything or did they just not do a check at all? I guess we'll never know, but what we can be certain is the check on these two inmates was not properly conducted if conducted at all. The lawsuit also cites that the prison didn't hold a meeting as they were apparently supposed to do about whether or not it was a good idea to place these two men together in a cell. I wonder why. Apparently, at the time of the funeral, Luis's family still did not know any of the grisly details about what had happened to him, and they had a closed casket, so they didn't know, and they would find out these details through the news after they had already laid him to rest. And that seems extremely messed up as well. Now, because Korokan is known for its brutal nature and history of crooked correction officers, there's a lot of speculation that these inmates were put together intentionally. Because no one would admit it, speculation continues as to whether it was Jamie or Luis that was the intended target. Based on Jamie's extremely violent nature and the outcome, I would guess that they had it out for Luis for some reason. And the poor guy got probably way more than anyone had bargained for there. Clearly, Jamie Osuna was inspired by the Joker. He tattooed and even cut into his own face to make it look like the Joker's. He would also draw Joker smiles on people in pictures as threats, commenting below, why so serious? And, of course, he carved the Joker smile on Luis and wrote what he wrote on the wall. So not only was he inspired by the Joker, he literally behaved like him, cold, uncaring, and just straight brutal, without reason per se, and without any remorse. How does one get to this point? Unfortunately, there are many factors that brought Jamie to where our story began, and I will try and give you a quick rundown of them, but like I said, it is a lot. So Jamie was born on March 7th of 1988, but his abuse would literally begin in the womb, unfortunately. When his mother was pregnant with him, his father would beat her and sometimes even kick her right in the stomach. One of these assaults actually resulted in brain damage for Jamie before he was even born, and there was physical damage to his right ear that you could actually see in this baby photo of him. Jamie's parents had married the year before Jamie was born and had divorced the year after, which is great, except the man Jamie's mother replaced his father with was just as bad, if not even worse. Jamie's mother, Michelle, would meet a man named Jeff, and Jamie's father would exit the picture shortly thereafter this. There would be an incident where he would hold a knife to Jeff's throat, but after that, he was gone, and Michelle would go on to marry Jeff. 
One of the first very notable incidences that occurred between Jamie and Jeff was when Jeff pushed Jamie out of a moving vehicle when he was an infant, still in his car seat, which is likely why he is still alive. This incident would further the brain damage that Jamie already had from his father beating his mother while she was pregnant with him. So Jamie really isn't off to a great start and unfortunately Jeff's abuse would only continue from there. When he was only five years old, Jeff would tie him to a tree and just wail on him with a belt. And why? Apparently he had spilled some juice. A five-year-old had spilled some juice. This is just beyond heartbreaking to me. His mother would call 911 and the beating would be that bad, but by the time the police had come, Jeff had already untied Jamie and tried to make light of the situation. He would be charged and found guilty of child cruelty for this incident, but he was allowed home with Jamie just a few days later and nothing changed. <sighs> Don't even get me started there. On top of this, Jamie also had a half brother who was being abused by Jeff, but when Jeff went too far with him, he was allowed to go and live with their grandparents. And apparently they took Jamie's brother in and not Jamie because Jamie's grandfather didn't like Jamie. After this, Michelle and Jeff would go on to have two children together because that sounds like a fantastic plan, right? <laughs> So when this happened, things would get even worse for Jamie because Jeff would continue to abuse him. That would continue to escalate. But what was new was that he would show Jamie that he was capable of being a really good dad to his own children. He would do things like have a family dinner where Jamie was the only one without food to eat and then have him eat whatever scraps were left but on the floor like a dog after everyone else had ate what they wanted. It was around now that Jamie would begin to harm animals and cut himself. He said he would do both actions in attempt to feel something, which is really sad. Then one evening, Jeff would lock Jamie outside in the rain and when Jamie would be yelling to be let back in, Jeff would slam his bedroom window down so hard that it shattered and the glass fell all over Jamie and cut him bad enough where they had to bring him in to get stitches. And on top of all this, at one point around this time, his uncle threw a brick at him. He literally had no safe male role models or any role models really in his life. And as he grew up and reached middle school, he started to realize that the torture he was enduring at home wasn't what everyone went through in life. And at age 12, he was finally permitted to live with his grandparents after asking for years. Unfortunately, things would not look up from here. It seemed that enough damage had already been done at this point. He would start to get involved in various gangs and end up in juvie at age 15 for stabbing another boy. This would end up being his mother Michelle's wake up call and she would finally leave Jeff and ironically Jeff would die of a heart attack shortly thereafter while Jamie was still in juvie. Jamie would be released at age 19 and he would get back into some gang activity. Around a year later, he would be at a house party for a 16 year old boy. The boy's 37 year old mother was doing the uh, cool mom thing and supplying alcohol to her 16 year old and his friends trying to have a good time herself you know anyway she was having quite a good time and dancing with one of the younger boys and her nephew was also there and he was getting pretty upset watching that so he went looking for someone to kind of scare off the kid that she was dancing with and he found jamie Jamie agreed and grabbed a knife to threaten the guy, but ended up stabbing him. The police came and arrested him, but the mom whose name is not being shared to protect her identity had made a pretty lasting impression on him and he began to write to her from prison. She actually wrote back and the pair would reunite in November of 2009 when he was released. Jamie had started his facial tattoos up during this time behind bars, so she was in for a bit of a shock when she picked him up, but they still broke the ice and went to a motel together and she became pregnant as a result. 
Jamie actually wanted to step up and be a father, kind of like he never had, and he would marry her just three months later. Unfortunately, Jamie would repeat the cycle of abuse that he had endured and he would be physically abusive to his wife. It would get so bad that she would have to call the police and Jamie would actually be in prison when his son was born. He was released six months later and his wife gave him a second chance, but instead of taking advantage of that, he decided to get a little bit more into meth, which made him more violent. So this would continue and he would be in and out of prison. Things between him and his wife got so bad that she left him and got a restraining order against him, but he would continue to threaten to kill her and stalk her. One way that he would do this was by phone, but he would also just stand and stare outside of her windows until she would call the police and then disappear. On November 8th of 2011, Jamie would call his wife and say, put on the news, bitch. I just killed a woman at the Morocco Motel. His wife would call 911 and report this and nothing would be done until a body was found five days later. Yvette Pena was a 37 year old woman who was a little down on her luck and she was living at the El Morocco Motel at that time. She had six kids and she unfortunately was ultimately found by one of the motel workers. She had died from blunt force trauma, stabbing and asphyxiation. She still had what was described as stabbing instruments protruding from her back when they found her and the state of her body was so severe that all of the details have not been released to the public, but the responding officers would state that this was one of the worst scenes that they had ever encountered. No one could figure out how Jamie knew Yvette or if he knew her or why he picked her for such a horrible fate, but the best anyone could come up with was that she sort of resembled his wife. However, when asked about this, Jamie responded that if he wanted to kill his wife, he would have just killed his wife, which is probably true. I don't know. Jamie's response was that he met her the day that they found her, which is likely a lie given the state that they found her in and the call to his wife that he made five days prior. He would also state that the purpose of El Morocco Motel was for prostitution and meth. So uh, do what you will with that. He would say that he didn't kill her right up until 2017 when he would decide to plead guilty, not to give her family peace, oh no, but because he would prefer to start his time in prison over waiting for his trial in jail. Apparently jail was getting boring. So on March 14th of 2017, Jamie Osuna pled guilty to the murder of Yvette Pena and he would receive a sentence of life without parole. Jamie would roll his eyes at Yvette's family as they read their victim impact statement, which is just so horrible and disrespectful. And then he gave a thumbs up sign as the judge read his sentence. This would put him in Korakan where he would somehow get into a different inmate cell and slash him up so badly that he needed 67 stitches. Apparently, Jamie had a thing for requesting photographs of the crimes that he committed, so this inmate refused to have himself photographed so that there would be no chance of Jamie getting his hands on them for his trophy collection. I'm assuming of photographs? Then he would ultimately be placed with Luis Romero, and we are back to the beginning of today's story. A judge determined that Jamie was unfit to stand trial for Luis's murder, and he was transferred to Salinas Valley State Prison Psychiatric Inpatient Program. He was considered to be returned to competency a few months later, but has yet to be tried for the killing. He is formally charged with the murder of Luis and is still serving out his sentence of life without the possibility of parole for the murder of Yvette Pena. Officially, Jamie has been diagnosed with PTSD, unspecified schizophrenia spectrum, antisocial personality disorder, and borderline personality disorder. He has been described as being a psychopath, which I don't know, I could argue sociopath, but he's prone to manipulation and having no regard for others' feelings, definitely. 
Jamie's mother, Michelle, says that she wishes she could trade places with him. She feels responsible for how he turned out, and in a way, I think she's right. She was his mother, the person who was supposed to love and protect him, and she failed him pretty miserably in that aspect. And I'm not sorry for saying that, maybe a little, but she was a victim as well, both to his father and Jeff, who apparently Jeff would whip her with his belt and then pour salt into the wounds. So she was a victim too. But why didn't she leave? There are many reasons why people don't. Fear is often at the top. So unfortunately, what's done is done. But we can and should still talk about it and examine the ramifications of the abuse that happened. It certainly does not justify what Jamie ended up doing, but it certainly also contributed to it. I do always list a domestic abuse hotline at the top or in the description of my videos as well. If you need to reach out, reach out, even if it is just to a friend. I don't know. I just wish there were more things out there for people, but there are some and there are many people who genuinely care out there. And I am going to make that my positive note because I do feel that maybe, just maybe, had one person stood up for him in his childhood, maybe things would not have gotten so bad. Maybe they still would have, but Jamie as a child literally had no one to stand up for him. So I'm going to highlight the group Child Help today. Instead of trying to describe it for you, I'm going to play you their story because I think that this little video does it better justice than I would be able to. And I don't know about you, but I could sure use something slightly uplifting or very uplifting after talking about Jamie Osuna. So let's meet Yvonne and Sarah. Hello, my name is Yvonne Federson and I'm one of the co-founders of Child Help. And I'm Sarah O'Mara, the other co-founder of Child Help. We have been friends, oh my gosh, forever. <laughs> it feels like it. Uh, for about 70 years. I remember it like it was yesterday. Yvonne was already in the, the movie industry and uh, had made quite a name for herself. And we were members of the Hollywood Christian group. And then we ended up being Sunday school teachers at the Presbyterian Church. We kept running into each other. Then we were selected on the same television show. The that, Ozzie and Harriet show. Yeah, the Ozzie and Harriet show. But the highlight was when we were asked Yes. Out of all these people that came to interview for a specific UFO yes. type show, over 500 people came and they would take you to Korea, Okinawa, and Japan. This trip changed our life. And that is the greatest thing that ever happened to us at that moment. When we were in a typhoon that struck, we wanted to walk out and see the devastation from it. And we snuck out through the basement. We were crazy to go out, except we ran across 10 little children. They had no jackets on, no shoes. It was the coldest winter that Heber had on record. They were huddled together, fending off the cold. And Yvonne and I rushed out to them and said, where do you belong, honey? Where, where are your parents? And so we were gonna follow through with these children. And when we came back to the States, we got our friends together and we asked them if they would help us to help the children. And of course they all did. And at so that time, our good friends were um, Debbie Reynolds. and Connie Stevens, and they helped us raise funds in order to build our first orphanage. Then we built another one, and then we built another one, and then we built another one. 
So we built four orphanages for those children in Japan. We did not know where that would take us, of course. We don't know our future, but we keep our eye on our compassion for each hurting child. It's like when we received a call mm -hmm. uh, to be honored in front of Congress. But there were real reason for calling us there, even though they gave us an award for what we had done, was to ask if we would go into Vietnam and do the very same thing. Our plan was to help these children. We didn't know it at the time, but once we knew it was the right thing for us to do, no one is gonna change our minds. We were keynote speakers, and the Reagans were on the dais with us. And when we came back from the podium speaking about this, Nancy put her arm out and said, you're just the two to do it. And we said, do what? And they said, child abuse. It's the best kept secret in this country. You've got to do this. Sarah and Yvonne were both rising Hollywood starlets. You're talking about women who were in feature films. They had married Hollywood producers. Yvonne even had a, a relationship with Elvis Presley. A lot of how child help grew was because of the many, many relationships that they had in Hollywood with A-list celebrities of that time. Bob Hope, Frank Sinatra. This was the life that they had constructed and built and worked their lives to achieve. They were on their way and they gave it all up. And they gave it all up because they saw something that was bigger than themselves. The 65th anniversary of Child Help commemorates an organization of long standing inside this country. Not many organizations last 65 years, especially organizations that started by tackling a subject that nobody wanted to even acknowledge existed. Doing that not just through legislation, but through prevention, creating the only evidence-based prevention education curriculum on the market today for students pre-K through 12th grade. Creating the only national hotline that is staffed by master or doctoral degree counselors. Expanding the knowledge of re-traumatization and the effects that that have on a child and on a family and pioneering a multidisciplinary model so that when a child discloses that they've been abused, they never have to re-suffer the trauma of that once again. For two women who've never themselves been exposed to abuse, for them to take this cause on, for them to believe in the needs for our children to find a voice on their behalf. I am one of those kids. I was one of those kids. I know I was drawn to child help because of what happened when I was a little boy growing up in this very town from a step-grandfather. I know what it feels like to be in a setting in which there was no care or treatment in those days. There were no programs. Nobody even believed the child abuse physically or sexually occurred in this country in those days. To speak the story, to know the story of where they started, how they started, to walk through their whole life, entire life. And they just kept marching on. And um, so many times when troubles would happen and financial problems would happen, we would just pray. And honestly, the money would just come in and the children would be okay. We would not be impacting and changing the lives of more than 12 million children if it was not for Sarah and Yvonne. And this landscape of abuse that we are getting ready to reshape and change and address more significantly than we ever have in our past would have never been possible if it wasn't for the bravery of starting this global movement by Sarah and Yvonne. What do you want your legacy to be? Well, I would like for people to say, you know, those two women taught me that the answer, the key to life, is to serve others. How about that? <laughs> I'm going to agree with Sarah there and leave you with that. If you would like to support this organization, you can check out childhelp.org to learn more. And I'll be back with another Joker Killer next week. At the moment, I'm not sure which yet, but it'll be a surprise. Stay safe out there and have a fantastic week, everybody. Bye. Mm -hmm.